Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another edition of the show. So um, of course I'm gonna find this out when I do the editing, but, and I will, by the time the show comes out, I will have known whether or not this was, this happened. But apparently last episode, I did not have the voice recorder working or recording for that episode. So everything was camera, was all the camera microphone, which sucks. And this is, this is recording now. So, um, yeah, sorry about that. I thought I hit record and put it in my pocket. Maybe I hit record twice by accident. Um, but I'll know here in a few, in, I'll know here in about half an hour whether I recorded anything. All right, so let's get on with this uh, episode. Um, this should be the episode right before Thanksgiving. And this particular week, I should be, uh, I should have already come back from Lake Charles. So I'm on vacation right now. All right, so we've got two oddball wines. We're just going to put it that way. Two wines I've had. One wine I've had for a minute. Another wine I've had for less than a minute. Um, and I've been very reluctant, uh, maybe even reluctantly crouched on the starting line, um, to try these wines even though I remember the first one I bought kind of like, ah, I'll get a wine from Georgia. So, um, and I don't mean the state, but over the years, I was just like, nah, 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 nah. kind of like the, the booze Tanat from last week. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it. So digging deep into the library of my wines going, what can I review? It was like, you know what? I got to review it sometime. I picked these two wines. So the first one is the 2005, 10 years old. And I think it was, I think I've had this wine for three years. Um, 2005 D Collection or the JSC Corporation Kins Morali uh, Mukuzani. Yeah, Mukuzani. Bought it at Specs for $10.99. Um, so this wine. So here's the thing. This wine is kind of unusual already. So this is a native grape of Georgia. Let's kind of go through what we got going on. So the Mukuzani, Mukuzani uh, wine is a dry red wine uh, from Georgia using the Saparavi grape uh, in Mukuzani Kaheti. And Mukuzani Kaheti, because Kaheti is like a province of Georgia. It's the southeastern part of Georgia, if I remember correctly. Um, is the same from other wines made from the same grape and that's aged in oak casts for at least three years. Um, whereas the other wines that use the grape are only aged for two years, um, or one. Uh, they talk about the tasting notes. Um, has more complexity than other wines made from the Saparavi grape. Uh, and they say it particularly goes well with steak and dark meats. Um... It has been produced since 1888. This is all from Wikipedia. Uh, it's like the first part of the Wikipedia entry. Um, it's considered by many to be the best of the Georgian red wines made from the Saparavi grape. And then it talks about how many medals it's won, but whatever. Um, it, it's, it's kind of, it's one of those weird information things like, yeah, there's not only one producer that's made it. Um, now, what about Georgia? Georgia's been making wine for eight thousand years so depending on who you ask this is one of the oldest well this is one of the oldest winemaking areas of the world and this may have been where winemaking first happened though it could have happened a couple other places but eight thousand years um the fertile valleys of the south Caucasus. uh 
Caucasus House, the source of the world's first cultivated grapevines in Neolithic wine production. Um, now, Saparave literally means paint or dye due to his intensive dark red color. Uh, is an acidic tincture type grape. So, if I think I pronounced that word right, I, I always tincture. Um, this is uh, f for those who've been watching for a while. Kids, what does that mean? That means it actually has red juice. Most grapes, no matter what color the outside, the, gra the grape skin is, produce a clear yellowish um, grape juice. Um, this actually has red juice because the 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 um, the uh, anthocyanins, right? Whatever it's called. Um, the thing that colors the grape skin actually is in the pulp instead of like not in the pulp. Uh, it's a hardy variety known for its ability to handle extremely cold weather and it's popular for growing in high altitude and inland regions. Uh, it originated in the Kaheti region of eastern Georgia. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba, da -da -da -da, da -da -da, it's one of the most important grapes for Georgia winemaking. And it has been used in Georgia, other regions of Eastern Europe. And um, apparently the Finger Lakes in New York are experimenting with this grape. All right, so the JSC Corporation Kins, Kins Morali is located in historic Cavarelli, uh, in the, I'm sorry, in the historic Cavarelli Castle in the town of Cavarelli, uh, Cavarelli, Cavarelli, or maybe I guess, in the... Kins Morali micro zone. Uh, they own approximately 150 hectares of vineyards, of which 100% are in historic Kins Morali, Kins Morali micro zone. They produce 25 different varieties of wine and about 10 brandies, or they, they put down cognacs in a weird spelling. Um, use, using grapes harvested from the vineyards as well as from local farmers. <clears throat> Let's see. The, 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 uh, the, they just talked about who they are, what they do. When you go to the actual website, the Chateau Cavarelli, or they own a hotel called Chateau Cavarelli. When we go to the actual website um, listed on whatever, the Georgia wine page, you get this, you get them, but the labels are called different. This exact wine does not show up on the webpage. Uh, so anyway, so let's kind of go into a little bit of history. Um, so the actual, it says the corporation dates back, but it doesn't. The actual winery, uh, or the land, uh, dates back to 1533, uh, connected with the construction of the Cavarelli Fortress, within the walls of which, according to decree of Levon Didi, the king of Kakheti, the wine cellar Morani, was constructed along with other buildings of different purpose. So you have to realize that this translated from Georgian dialect, so kind of the English is weird. Um, they also produce molasses and wine for, for, uh, for rich people. This is only for grand people and the royal family. Um, and they go through some other stuff we don't need to talk about. During the reign of Erical the King, uh, the royal wine cellar was called Erical the King's Wine Cellar, or simply uh, Erical's Wine Cellar, with all functions preserved from the times of Levin the King. Yeah, it didn't make any sense either. Um, so anyway, they, they've been they've been around for a long time, um, and I'm not going to go through the whole history. Um, we're going to get to a little bit more modern times. So in 1975, uh, they reorganized the the wine cellar and enterprise founded on the basis was called the Cavrelli Winery of Samtris Kins and Morale Production Association, which had produced wines and cognac spirits. Um, they basically produced wine for Soviet Russia, and it was, it was over there that existed until about 1990. And then we have Perestroika happening, and the company's, the company's founders of Tomas Konchavili, you know, I'm not going to read these guys' names. I'm just going to butcher them. But anyway, the, wines, the, the founders of the winery uh, established an enterprise called Vazis uh, Srembeli. Srem, I'm not even pronounce that, what that is. Uh, operated for three years under the under that name in '93, um, they transformed it into another corporation, uh, which also operated for three years, and then um, they bought some more vineyards and areas and hectares and all that stuff, and um, 
Then they became the joint stock company, JSC. Um, in 96, they made a decision to change the name um, to the JSC Kins Morali Corporation, which is basically what this is. But now the name's kind of changed a little bit again, too. Um, and let's see. That's it. So, <clears throat> the National Red Grape of Georgia. We're about to try it. Now, there are, this is the dry version of, of the wine. Uh, the ones that are aged less are, are uh, apparently um, sweeter or semi-sweet. So, let's see how this is. I'm excited, but yet kind of apprehensive about trying this wine. Mainly because I don't know how good it is. Um, I don't know how good the wine's going to be. It's 10 years old. I don't know how well these wines actually age. Um, God knows how long it sat on spec shelf when I bought it. I've probably had it for three years, two, at least two years of which it was not in the wine cooler. Um, so, you know, it probably spent... We'll see, it aged for three years, so 2008 to, we'll see, 2012, so about four years, it was sitting in just, you know, whatever ambient temperature, and, uh, oh, longer. <laughs> so, let's see how it is. Okay, that's different. Oh, I thought, I was wondering there's something on the back I wanted to read. No. All right, so... Interesting in a good way, nose, I guess. I don't know. Definitely different on the nose. Very earthy. Almost funky. But not like that wine a couple weeks ago where I was, or was it last week's wine, where I was kind of concerned the funkiness was like corked funkiness. This is almost like, almost like smoky. And not in a smoke bomb way, not sulfur smoke. Almost smoky, but almost barnyard, kind of, maybe not. But like meaty, roasty, like roasted meat. There's something else I just can't put my, I just can't my, put my finger on exactly what the aroma is, but there's there's definitely earthiness, roasted roasted meat quality, um, forced floor, foresty that type of stuff, right? Nothing really floral, nothing really fruity about it. All right. Well, it didn't kill me. Um, it's again, it's very rustic. Um, rustic is a good word for it, and I don't mean rustic as like it's like shitty. Sorry, bad wine. Um, it's not like bad in, in that way. I mean, it's actually, I, I would I would say, it's not poorly made. It's not flawed. But um, I definitely, you definitely need to have this with roasted meats you've got to have this with earthy type of food you're you're not gonna you're not gonna put this with hamburgers okay um maybe sausages you know maybe you know barbecued stuff um i know i mentioned pot roast and and that type of stuff the last two shows but this really really needs some earthy food now i kind of skipped over um what they talked about pairing this with because they didn't want to like get all, how do you get wine on here? I didn't want to get all influenced by that necessarily. The back of the label actually has talked about it. Um, the excellent partner to game roasts and grilled meats. So I, I could see that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a, a barbecue wine 
but I could see this as a barbecue wine. They call it a spicy nose. I can kind of see that, but I look at it as more like a smoky nose. It's not a bad wine at all. <clears throat> it's definitely a food wine. I would love to be in Georgia eating some roasted meats, you know, um, yeah, drinking this wine there. Um, it's got a decent amount of tannin structure. It's not really high, it doesn't have a super high acidity, though my mouth is watering. Um, it's not a bad wine, it's $11. I mean, what do you expect? This is not some $100 you know, $200 cult cab from Napa. And it's 10 years old. It's actually drinking really well for 10 years. This is a wine that most people are probably not gonna like. Um, I don't mind the wine, it's not terribly bad. I definitely want to have some food with it. I mean, we got some friends coming in town here soon. I have no idea how many times we're going to go out to dinner, if we're going to have anything at the house. I've got a lot of open wine to, to, uh, to use with these guys. I might experiment with these guys in this wine. I can say this on the show because even if they do watch the show, they won't see this after they get here. <laughs> so, um, Chicken Joe, if I, if I subject you to this wine, I hope you liked it. If not, oh well. Um, this is geeky wine in the sense that people like me are going to be like, ooh, cool, interesting, and maybe kind of like it. But your average American consumer is probably going to be like, yeah, give me a cab any day. So this is definitely a wine that if you see on the list, try it. Hopefully it's, on a, hopefully it's in a restaurant that caters to this type of wine. You know, hopefully it wasn't just because you know the wine rep had to sell the wine and somebody said, okay, fine, I'll buy a case. Um, and then they regretted it. Hopefully they bought it because they knew what they were getting, um, that type of stuff. So, not a, um, not a horrible wine. And not, not the best wine, but it's, it's all right. It's $11, it's, it's, it's decent, it's pretty decent. If you see it, Take a risk on it. Now, one thing I do want to mention about this wine is when you look for this exact wine, it's always a 2005, okay? So, like I said, the company kind of changed its name. It kind of changed some stuff up. I couldn't find the exact, I think, I think the actual word wording, the, you know, the Mukazani was here, but I think they changed their name to like Tilly or something like that. It kind of looks like the same label. It's red and gold but it's a little bit different. So I think they kind of did a little name change, maybe ownership change. So that one is what, what I found kind of on the interwebs, the actual website that's connected to this, the, you know, with the, with the same symbol, well, you have it on the front too, with the same emblem and all that. Their, their wine labels look more French, look more European instead of this, you know, like what the hell type of wine label. So I don't know if the, how the wine is with that, but you know what? I tried it. Yet another check mark on the grape varieties that I've never had. Wine number two. All right. So let's get the timer going on the watch. I'm kind of digging the watch here. Now at this point within the show, um, this, you know, where this show is doing, I don't know if I'll still have this watch. A friend of mine uh, has allowed me to borrow the watch because she knows I'm really interested in buying one. And I kind of want to check it out. I've pretty much already made up mine. I'm going to buy one. I just don't know if I'm going to get the, this. I don't know if I'm going to buy this watch, which is the 38 millimeter or buy the 42 millimeter watch. All right, I'm already pouring the wine. I haven't even talked about it yet. So this is the, uh, I'm going to go back over here. This is the Cabanero wine. Let's kind of get this all, boom. This is the non-vintage 
Cabanero Vineyards, Muy Caliente, Habanero Heat, Cabanero Red, Rowdy, Roaring Rowdy Robust, Table Wine with Natural Habanero Flavors. I have no idea if you can find this in your part of the world, um, in the United States or elsewhere. Um, it was bought by a friend of mine because she thought it'd be kind of funny for me to try because it has actual habanero flavoring in it. So um, when you go to their website, it's just, you know, a BS site. Um, it is actually run by um, the wine group. And make sure you go to the correct the wine group website, otherwise, otherwise you're going to go to some spam website and hopefully not get infected your your computer. Um, but the wine group they are a pretty large. Say they are the with the third largest wine producer by volume. So I mean they they make cupcake, Franzia, flip flop, and Almaden. And um, not making passing judgment on any of these wines. I know some of these wines are really popular. A lot of people love these wines. I mean, if they didn't, they wouldn't be selling tons of this wine. Um, definitely easy drinking everyday wines, which is what people want, right? They don't. Not everyone's going to drink hundred dollar bottles of wine because they're just they're not going to. Um, so, from what I could tell, uh, there is a a local wine guy named Cecil Flintage, a uh, cool guy. I don't ever get to really hang out with him a lot, but I've met him a few times. Um, he wrote a couple years ago in a uh, local wine blog type of thing called Savor SA. He wrote a little review on it, and uh, he says that uh, basically the major grocery store chain, HEB, um, so it's basically a Texas grocery store chain, uh, created, I guess, wanted a wine that would be a good Tex-Mex type of wine or just have something kind of novelty-ish. So um, <clears throat> apparently it's a blend of California Cabernet, uh, so Cabernet Sauvignon, Petit Verdot, and Syrah infused with habanero spice. Um, it also says there's a, there is a little residual sugar, but less than many white Zinfandel wines. Um... This wine was crafted to match the light sweetness. Uh, can be so without another. And with the dishes that this wine was crafted to match, the light sweetness can be a pleasant addition. HEB recommends that you pair this wine with chicken mole, carne asada. Um, I have no idea what the next one was. Um, and I, I grew up here in San Antonio. Whatever this dish is, I had no clue what it is. Flan, carnitas, and tamales. Ooh, tamales. All right. So, I am a little scared. Probably this cork isn't even the right cork to be using the Corbin with, but I just I didn't feel like going to get my wine opener. All right. So, um, let's try it. <laughs> oh, my God. Connie, I'm going to kill you. By the way, Connie is also the person that's lending me her watch. She's the one who bought this wine. She was laughing, too. I think she's had it, too. She, I think she liked it, but... All right, so let's not take such a big whiff. Okay, so... Definitely, is, I've never smelled a wine like this in my life. I mean, there's kind of a bit of spicy sweetness, like a sweet and sour, but a sweet and spicy kind of aroma to it. Maybe red fruit. Cinnamon. Cinnamon for freaking days. It's like a red hot is what it smells like. Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Yeah, kind of like that. All right. Let's try it. And this is the reason why this is the very last wine I'm reviewing tonight. We're going to try one more time.
kind of going to kill you. All right, let's try to be serious about it. You see, I dumped it. I'm not going to drink any more of it. So it really is like getting those red hots and, and, and like liquefying them and drinking that. Okay, it's cinnamon and pepper and just that for days. It's spicy. And I love spicy food. So it's not like I'm going, oh, but it's definitely spicy. Um, there is a bit of sweetness to it, yes, um, which you kind of need with spicy food. You kind of need some sweetness. Um, would it pair with Tex-Mex? Yeah, it would. I can see it. I can see this as being a Tex-Mex type of wine. It is a novelty wine. It cost about $10. I forgot to say that earlier. So I'm the, I know it had on lower third. Lower third. It costs about ten dollars. Um, it's a novelty wine. Cecil talked about. I guess. I guess the, the same wine group created a a white wine that had jalapeno in it too. Because when you go to the wine, we go to the Caminero wine website. You can buy the the white wine too, or actually the wine group. I don't know. One of the websites they have the the jalapeno. I think it's called the jalapeno. So it must be like a Pinot Grigio with jalapeno spice in it. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I could see this with that, you know, like they talk about like tamales and, and chicken mole because you got the chocolate in there. Um, I could see that this actually might have been an okay wine with what we had for dinner today, which was two episodes ago you saw. Um, it was like this chicken with chicken and chicken baked with salsa and cheese. Um, so this might have actually been an okay wine with that, but this is definitely not up my alley. If you're looking for something that's different, interesting, you'll never have probably again in your life in a good way. Okay, um, you, you'll never find it. You'll never find it anywhere else. And you're, I guess you're in the Texas market because. Um, I have, well, according to the, to the website, they can ship in other states. So this is not just a HEB exclusive wine. I mean, maybe a couple years ago it was an HEB wine. Um, they just said we can't ship to a couple states. But if you're looking for something completely off the wall, something you want to have fun with with your friends, and you're not going to take too seriously, and you like spicy food, you like habanero or jalapeno, sure, pay the 10 bucks for it. Have some fun with it. Don't take it seriously. Um, it's not. It's not the worst wine I've ever had. You know, I, I wouldn't. If I was giving scores, I would not give it like some sixty-five point score or something like that. But it is definitely not a wine that I personally like. Um, but I can see the use for it. I can see where people might have some fun with it. Um, but. You're not gonna have more than a glass of it, and at that rate, you probably only have about half a glass of it. And you're gonna be like, okay, I got it. The novelty's over, and then you're gonna want to move on to a beer, probably, or something different. Um, but that's about as much of a recommendation as I can give on it. All right, so um, that's gonna do it for this episode. Next week should be Thanksgiving episode, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to whatever I pick for those wines. Uh, anyway, that's gonna be it. Uh, again, thank you for stopping by. Hit, click the links above to friend me up. Hit the donate button over here to send me some ducats so I don't have to buy wines like this. Granted, this was donated to me, but I did buy that one. It wasn't that bad. Um, <laughs> leave comments below. Give me five stars on iTunes. Check me out everywhere else on Roku, TiVo, YouTube, uh, podcasts. It's iTunes already. You know, where, wherever you can find me, check it out. Tell your friends. And uh, we will see everyone again next time.